things. And a lot of people being broken. How many feel like I've been going through a real brokenness? Been a lot of physical affliction. A lot of leaders that I know from, um, you know, some have not put it out publicly. But, but every major leader I know has gone through a serious challenge physically in the last year. Even t unto death. Almost every one of them I know. Um, I'm sure if you'd like uh, Ray Hughes, the guy I walk with, Dennis Walker. He just had a heart attack five weeks ago. And uh, my goodness, he's already healed. He's going on a vacation next week. But, but what it is, is we're learning how to not think, well, there's something wrong. See, what God's trying to do, I don't think we need to get sick. I think we need to pay attention and take a break every now and again. Are you guys with me? I'm in this deal for the long haul. I'm not in it for a short run. I'm in this deal for a long haul. And uh, so I'm paying attention to that. And when I had that encounter back in November, when the doctors told me, uh, you've got a terminal sickness and uh, you're not going to make it. I, and, and, I, and I shared on Friday night, I have never even been in the hospital except to go minister to people. I've never been, when I get sick, I get well. But I got stuck. They hooked me up to all the machines. And I'm going to tell you something. I am not wired for that. Are you guys with me? And I already made some decisions how I was going to run this race. I'm not going to go down. I'm not going to go down wimpy, but I'm going to go down fighting. How many say amen? Anyway, the Lord in five months turned it all around, but I learned a lot of lessons in that season. And part of it's the message that I taught last night. And I'm going to teach one tonight, this morning that I got. And um, I'm just going to read two scriptures. And hopefully you guys can kind of help me out. I'm going to, I want you to turn to Proverbs 9. Turn to Proverbs 9 and put your finger there and let's just pray for a minute. Lord, I pray that I'll be able to release everything I need to release in 30 minutes. But I pray that people get so hungry that as they begin to hear what I'm going to share, they'll be changed. The spirit that has been gripping them will be broken and this will be the beginning of a new day. They're going to get more than they've ever got. They're going to hear more than they've ever heard. And they're going to catch more than they've ever received. I declare that today. I'm praying for this house. I'm praying for this region. This region is not which a little flash pan thing. This thing is about to catch a whole new momentum. I can hear the wave of the tsunami coming in. And it's starting to roar. And I'm going to release that on you. That as you begin to catch it, people's going to run away. And they're going to run into the things of God. Because you're going to be standing on the other side of that tsunami waiting to catch them. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm prophesying to you while I'm praying. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Quit trying to play church and be the kingdom people that you're called to be. You're not called to be a bunch of whips. You're called to be warriors. You're kings and priests. Kings and priests were never wimpy. Anytime a king never went to battle is when he was defeated, when he was caught into lust and perversion. And his children's children paid. And I'm declaring, this is the generation. Our generation is going to turn everything around. Our children are going to keep going off into drugs, keep failing, be bitter at the church. They're going to be kingdom people and have a whole new day of building in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, again, I waste, I, I tell you, you got Proverbs 9, and let's just read verse 10. And it says this, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And then I want you to look at, at uh, uh, Proverbs 10, verse 7. <clears throat> no, that's not the verse I want. I want 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy 1, 7. And it says this. I'm going to back up to verse 6. I always, when I read scripture, I always see something good on either side of it, and I sometimes get lost. Yeah, verse 6, it says, Therefore I remind you to keep ablaze. Everybody say ablaze. Or really what that word's saying, keep burning, baby. Turn to somebody right now and say, burn, baby, burn. You're, you're in the state where, ve ve where Elvis made that popular. Burn, baby, burn. Ablaze the gift of God that is in you. See, the church teaches people to control your gift instead of just let it assume, let it explode, let it take everything around them. Are you guys with me? Yeah. See, we've, we've been taught 
because we didn't understand that we're a burning bush. See, the miracle wasn't the fire. The miracle was the word of the Lord that came out of the fire. And you're supposed to be on fire so the word of the Lord could come out of you. All right. Ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of hands. Why do we lay on of hands? To stir up the fire in you. To release, to fan the flame of God. We, we did that on Friday night. We did that last night. And I think tonight we'll have a party down. Is that a good idea, Eric, to have a party down tonight? We're just going to fan the flames tonight. We're going to release things. I feel like there's some new things. Some of you have been working very mature in your gifts, but God's about to release some new gifts. Because we're coming into a new day where we're going to need new tools. And I talked about that last night. And uh, let me try to finish this verse. See, I always get sidetracked when I start reading that stuff. Now, here's the verse I want. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or fearfulness. Everybody say, spirit. Did you notice the other scripture that I read in Proverbs said, the fear of God. It didn't say the spirit of fear, it said the fear of God. Are you with me? But right here it says, God hadn't given us a, everybody say it with me, spirit. A spirit of fear. The enemy dances on the spirit of fear. Everything in our lives is, is entertained to try to stop you from being a burning bush that'll catch the world on fire for the glory of God by le resting a spirit of fear in you. Man, I learned this when I just went through this last season. I never understood there was a difference between a spirit of fear and fear. There is. And I'm going to try very quickly explain it to you. And let me just finish that verse. For God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Are you with me? So, so the antidote to a spirit of fear is love. That word love there means agape. It's God's love that only he can give you. We can entertain, I'm going to say, measures of love in our humanity, but there's nothing like the love of God. Like when Wendy said last night she was sitting down here, and the glory of God, nobody, she was minding her own business, and God showed up. The Lord Jesus showed up. And I want to put a little bit more on that thing she said about a peach. See, you think, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. But you see, God does things with us to give us a, a, a desire and to stir our hearts to look at the mysteries of who he is. And he, and he said a peach, and I told you last night, because I did some teaching on fruit, what fruit was. And there was an interesting thing I found about the fruit, a peach. Do you know the first year, any farmers in here that's ever re raised peaches or, or, or anything? The first harvest of every peach tree that's not hybrid, you don't eat any of that fruit because it's bitter. And that seed that's in that bitter fruit, if you'll plant that seed, the first season, if you plant that seed, that tree will bear sweet fruit. <coughs> is there some water? Is there water? Thank you. Now this, are you getting this? You see, what Wendy was really saying, God was telling her, you're mature. The season of bitter fruit is over. Amen. The sour things are over. And what I saw with that was going in to take the promises. The children of Israel, when they went into the land of promise, they got grapes so big they were the size of watermelons. You bust one on your head and you'll drown. We just did a Lord's Supper thing. I was going to share this with you. We did it all over the city. Everybody's got all their different theologies and doctrines about taking the Lord's Supper. We had probably 100 churches show up in Vegas this last July 4th. And we all worshipped in front of the government buildings. But we took the Lord's Supper and we've never done that before. I thought, how in the world are we going to do that? And those guys were so creative. You know what they did? They got grapes... And they brought grapes, and they brought certainly the, 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 the unleavened bread or the crackers. But those grapes really spoke to me because that was the, that was the wine of the Spirit. Isn't that cool? 
And it was just like a refreshing. And you thought, wow, we're, we're all eating this new fruit and that blood. You could just feel healing going on all over the place. It was awesome. Anyway, that's a side issue. Okay. So, anyway, that thing. Thank you. That thing that you had was really good. It's got a lot more in it. And other people get other things. Okay, I want to talk this morning about fear. Everybody in here deals with fear. You cover it in a lot of ways. We've learned in the church, a lot of times we tell people just suck it up, put a smile on, but don't deal with it. Because we don't know how to deal with fear. See, do you know there's over 144 references in the scripture to fear? And every one of them, almost the biggest crux of them, probably a third of them, when the, it was when there was an encounter with God. Whenever the angel of the Lord came to Mary, what did the angel of the Lord say? When the angel of the Lord came to Joseph, what did the angel of the Lord say? Are you catching me? It's all through scripture. Fear not. Why? Because there's a natural function that happens in our emotion when we encounter God. There's a, we, God gave us the natural emotion of fear to protect us. But what the enemy's done, he's taken it and not let us lean into Jesus, embrace whatever is happening in the moment, because God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love. See, that's the key. I got to get his love. I got to step into worship. I got to step into a declaration. I got to grab an old promise. The prophetic's important because that is the weapon that you use to war against fear when it comes against you. Are you with me? See, we, do, we war with the scripture naturally. We've all been taught to war with the scripture. But that scripture's got to come off the page and be revelation and blow on you. Are you with me? I grew up studying the Word of God. I grew up a good Southern Baptist boy, so I know the Word. Are you with me? But I'm not going to argue about that with you. It's, it's helped me to stand so confident when I get revelation on something to know I can't be moved. There's too many people that don't study the Word, don't eat on the Word, and they have an encounter with God, and then the enemy just sees them and gives them a whole different interpretation than what it really means in Scripture. Like I've heard people come to me and say, God told me to leave my wife. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. Are you guys with me? Now, if she leaves, that's a choice. Or he leaves, that's their choice. Are you with me? And you got to hear God on how you need to deal with that. My point is, if you don't know the word, you won't get back in a position to get past the fear and step into faith. Fear is the counterpart of faith. And the enemy's always working to put fear in you. Some of you is afraid to come to church. You know there's going to be some loud mouth prophetic guy come in. You're afraid to get too close. But that's why I like to walk in the back. Now, I try to stay in the camera's view and, and all that today. But, but here's the deal. See, that fear, the enemy t has taken and perverted it so that he can keep you on the run and keep you off your feet and keep you from pushing through because God's about to trust you. The greatest torment of the enemy is when you overcome fear. You don't realize we judge the enemy. Not after we die, right now. And we do it when we keep our peace when hell is coming against us. When everybody betrays us, I hold my peace. For the God of peace is crushing Satan underneath my feet. Are you guys with me? That is not a wimpy position of peace. That is a militant position saying, yeah, I'm a little afraid in the flesh, but where am I going to go but to Jesus? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? I wish I could sing. So do you. But here's the deal. <laughs> I'm trying to keep... Man, this is a loaded message. I love this message because it really opened my eyes. And I, and I said this on Friday night. When that doctor gave me that prognosis, I have never, ever... I mean, I don't get sick. You ask me, I mean, we, we've been together over 40 years. I, outside of cold, a little flu every now and again. I usually get over it pretty quick. God's blessed me with pretty good health. But this one here, I'd had something that had hit me for almost a year. And uh, when that doctor gave me a prognosis that I was going to die, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting just to go and get some antibiotics to get over it. He said, you're going to die. And the truth was, God was setting me up to teach me what I'm teaching you today. And here's what it is. 
See, that fear gripped me. I'm thinking, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of not finishing my race. I am consumed that I fulfill my destiny. And the enemy's doing everything to knock you off your pathway to your promise. That's why churches and leaders right now are being tested. You know, we thought, we thought the glory ship came in when Toronto hit. Well, that was the beginning, but now we're in the second season. The tree, the seed, has been replanted, and now there's some new fruit growing. And we've got to learn how to embrace it after we've eaten the bitter fruit. Are you with me? That's way bigger. you messing with me with that, word, that vision you had. Okay, that fear came on me. When that doctor came and told me, and I'll tell you what it literally saw. See, when you're prophetic, you've been, and I apologize. Sometimes when I'm preaching, I see these visions and I say things that I shouldn't say. Like the statement I made about ghosts last night, and I'm not going to repeat it again. Some of you guys kind of got a little shocked when I said it. Well, I thought about it. I thought, yeah, I was a little shocked too. But, but here's the deal. See, this doctor came in. I'm a real visual. If you're prophetic people, you're usually real visual. And he comes in and he says, you've got a terminal sickness. I had a, I, I'm not going to explain all that again. You'll have to, you should have been here Friday night. But here's the deal. And I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying. We're building. When he said that, it was like somebody, the enemy, put a body bag on me. Now, now I'm a Vietnam veteran, so I know and I've smelled, I've dealt, and I've been in the midst of death. I know what that is. And I can even smell death. When that doctor told me that. Because see the enemy was waiting for me to get in a compromised place physically. To try to stop me. Again. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of not fulfilling my destiny. Are you with me? If God's given you promises. That's how you can hold on. When that fear starts to grip you. You need to go back. See, that's what I love about my friend Bill Johnson. We first started traveling before anybody knew who Bill Johnson was. We used to go do this kind of stuff together. And he'd take his binder. And he said, wonder what you think of these words. And it had every word he'd ever had from the age of about 12 years old. And that was before all the digital stuff we had. And he had it written down. And he said, I just go through those every day just to remind myself of what God said. I wish I would have. See, as a prophetic person, I never kept a record of another. I just figured I'll get another one later. You know, and that's kind of foolish because you need to write it down and go back and visit that because when you're in the day of battle, you won't remember all the promises of God. So you need to do it either on an iPad or iPhone and paper, some way. You need to remember the word. That's why we, we thought when we were recording words, when we were starting to teach people how to move in the prophetic, we thought it was so we could be judged by the word. That wasn't why we were doing it. I've got a word I got over 20 years ago that's still unfolding. And I don't remember, I didn't hear half of that stuff when I got it the first time until after I walked through it. So I'm just saying, value the prophetic. Now here's the deal. And I'm going to move real, real fast. Fear, everyone in here deals with. When you're born, God gives you fear. It's, a, it's, a, it's an instinct. It's a function. And again, I said, it's mentioned over 144 times. It's an interesting study in Scripture when you see it. Now, there's sometimes judgment a lot in Scripture when there's fear. But there's a lot more about encounters with God, supernatural encounters. And uh, fear is actually an alarm clock. I'm, I'm going to change this so, see, most people feel condemned when they feel afraid, thinking, I don't have enough faith. No, it's God getting your attention to position yourself for a new place to move through. But nobody, see, I know as a prophetic voice, I've got to begin to tell the truth of this thing. God, thank God he's revealing how to deal with the onslaughts and the schemes of the enemy. Some of you guys are saying... I'm going to make you afraid. I'm going to beat your brains out after this over. I don't like what you preached. That don't make me, that don't make me move one bit. Fear is an alarm clock. Now, there's two things that you're born with as a baby. Do you know that there's two things that you're naturally afraid of? And it's not hot stoves. We react to that. The parents are afraid. Because they know the result of what happens. But a child doesn't know that. But God gave babies a natural instinct to respond to the alarm clocks of fear. And here's what, the, you want to know what they are? Does anybody know what they are? Huh? One is falling. 
It's being tossed off of something that you have no sense that you're going to be caught. So falling is a natural instinct. Why does God do that? Because he wants us to be aware where we put our feet to possess them. Are you with me? And so it's an alarm clock. When I feel like I'm falling, may attention. Now, I want to just kind of just say this just to explain some things. I, I've just been asking the Lord all kinds of things. And you know what? He'll answer you if you ask him enough because he don't like to be aggravated all the time. And uh, <laughs> it's like my dad. Now, here's the deal. Uh, I asked the Lord, what about falling under the power? Why? See, when we started saying that a lot, people were afraid. But they didn't realize what was going on. Until they understood that's the fear of God, not the spirit of fear. That's the fear of God. Because the word there, when you get consumed by the spirit and you fall, that word there is kabod. The heavy weight of God comes upon you and you can't hold yourself up because God is holding you and he's resting you in a place to, to, to visit you. Are you with me? Or to charge you or to empower you. Some people say, I'm not falling for nothing. Well, that's okay. Because see, it's interesting that I've watched the young people and I'm figuring this stuff out. Anybody remember the mosh pits they used to have a few years ago? You know, and I used to go preach at those things with those kids and say, jump, man, jump. I said, are you crazy? And they said, it's about trust in the people that you serve. Man, I've never forgot that. And the truth is, is when you fall, when God touches you, it's about trust in the people you're with. Are you with me? Now here's the other one. You know what the other one is? And it, it, it'll shock you. It's extreme loud noises. Why do we yell at our children? Because it's a natural way to get their... You're not... Prayerfully, once they learn, you don't have to yell, but they need to hear your voice as if it were a shout. A still small voice from God is a shout when we learn how to hear it. And it's not about volume. It's about clarity. It's about warning. Are you with me? I'm telling you, this is a big word here. This is really going to set people free all over this room. <coughs> Some of you have been afraid because somebody hurt you in the past. People are afraid to commit to church because somebody hurt them. You've got to get that spirit of fear off of you and get in the fear of God. Now let me give you a simple, simple definition of what the fear of God is. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the results of the prognosis I had. I wasn't dying. I had pneumonia. So when I get a cold, I get real susceptible. Now, here's what, here's what it is. See, let me just see if I can keep my track of thought. What was I talking about, Loretta? I'm testing you. Huh? the fear of God. Now I'm going to tell you what happened to me and this really gave me understanding. Many years ago I was ministering meetings like you do every time you get before people outpouring meetings and all that. And I stood up and you know I'm, I'm, I'm not bashful. I can communicate or I can at least make noise. And, and, but usually the Lord's with me and I know he's with me but I many times I'm very unconscious and I forget that he's with me. And I stood up this one time and and when I stood up, I couldn't feel anything. I knew what to do. See, we fake it till we make it. But I don't want to fake it till I make it. I want the extreme, tangible presence of God on me all the time. Now, I'm not going to feel the goosebumps all the time, but all I got to do is stop a minute and read out the Lord's with me, even if I'm in, in the middle of a video game. Or a football game, whatever. But I stood in this meeting and all of a sudden, I was afraid, extremely afraid. And this, this was probably 16 or 17 years ago, but until I got this revelation did I understand what happened. And, and, and so I went ahead and I did what I was supposed to do, did the announcement, introduced the people we had, because we were doing, we were, this is before everything happened at Reading, we were having citywide meetings to entertain revival. And my spiritual father was there. We'd invited him to be one of the speakers. And he recognized, he could see the look in my eyes that I was afraid. And I went and sat down after I got done. He said, what happened, son? I said, I don't know. What happened? I wanted an answer. You know what he said? Go home and pray about it. We'll have breakfast in the morning. And all night long, I said, Lord, what the heck happened? What happened? Why did I feel that way? And we got to breakfast that next morning. And he said this. 
He said, I've watched you minister for 25 years. And he said, you've always had boldness. And he said, in these 25 years, the Lord could be on the other side of town and you never knew it. But he said, last night, the Lord was with you and he moved a half an inch. And you were afraid of not being in his presence. You became very aware that you needed his presence more than anything. And he said, last night you got a promotion. You receive that fear. And when I feel that again, I stop and I say, where are you, Lord? Remember I said it's an alarm clock? It should get your attention to do or to respond or to wait. But it's not, a re it's not an indicator to run or to throw in the towel or to quit. Are you with me? We've got to wait. If we're not getting the answers, and why I told you about my example with that spiritual father, I wasn't getting it, but I was around. So that's why we need teams. That's why we need people partnering together. Because other people see things that you can't get. And i got about five minutes left. And uh, I'm going to... I'll just kind of go through this, uh, you know, kind of, kind of quick. It's an alarm clock. We... we the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God has not given a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and a sound mind. Now, I'm, I'll give you a lot of scripture, and you can read this later. I won't take the time to do it. But I'm going to challenge. See, the preacher's not supposed to force feed you, by the way. I'm so sick and tired of people saying, I'm not going to go to that church. That preacher don't feed me. He's not supposed to. He's supposed to make you hungry. He's actually doing his job. He should give you information that makes you hungry, but he's not supposed to give you all the answers. You're supposed to have an encounter with God. And he's supposed to release and delegate when the anointing comes on you to come into that new place to make everybody else hungry. I mean, say amen. And I'm telling you, that's for the young ones and the old ones alike. I get revelation from young ones and it just shocks me. Anyway, man, I could just tell you a lot of stories. Anyway, here's some scripture. I'll just read these off real quick. Uh, Romans 8, 15. I guess they're taping this so they can get it. Uh, Joshua 8, 1. Um, I read, I get that stuff and I just, it just gets me. Remember Joshua, the greatest warrior that I think has ever lived. The greatest hero, the greatest son that was ever born. The greatest model of a man who had a vision, who knew God. And the man that he served didn't know squat about God. His name is Moses. And Joshua served him. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. See, sometimes you're taking a lower position, but God's preparing you. He's, he's wanting to bless that one that you serve, but he's about to use you to bless many. Joshua, when God told him what he wanted him to do to conquer the enemy, he said, fear not. Why? Because he knew he had an emotion, a spirit of fear. And when, when the Lord said, fear not, he said, okay, I'm waiting, Lord. I hear the alarm. Give me instruction. And he said, fear not again. And he said it a third time. Because, see, Joshua was about to be a demonstrator of a kingdom breakthrough. He heard the fear not the first time from God the Father, the second time from the Lord Jesus, and the third time from the Holy Spirit who empowered him to conquer the enemy. Man, all this stuff. You can, I'll give you some stuff to unpack later, man. Uh, okay, here's some more scriptures. I hope I can get through these. Hebrews 11, 7. Noah moved with fear to build the ark. He was fearful. Nobody had ever built a boat. Nobody had seen rain, much less built a boat to float. How I many say amen? And get every stinking critter in the world in that thing. He had fear on every level, criticism. See, what I was talking about last night, he had everything. Oh, yeah. See, God's going to tell some of you, see, and you guys are risk takers. And Eric, you're one of those guys, you know, you're, a risk, ta you're risk takers. You're misunderstood. And I think that's in the group. How many say I'm kind of like that too? See, like I said, if you're not on the edge, you're taking up way too much real estate anyway. I wish I said that, but Bill Johnson said that. Anyway, here to go. Uh, Revelation 117. It's about the end days. Fear not. It's about Proverbs 19, 23, 20, 20, 23, Revelation 11, 11, Isaiah 11, 2, Isaiah 5, 59, 19, uh, Isaiah 59, 19, it talks about the standard of the Lord. When the enemy comes, the Lord 
will lift up a standard, comma, against him. Anyway, that's how you get rid of fear. We've got the fear of death. You've got fear of failures. You've got fear of your flesh. I see people afraid to move in God. I'm afraid I'm going to get in the flesh. Oh, shut up. What do you think Jesus was in? It's some of that religious junk you've been taught. Everything that has kingdom power, and it starts with your act of obedience in the flesh. We've got to quit worrying about that. And if it's wrong, guess what? You've got enough friends that will slap you upside the head and say you're off track. Uh, I'm being a little radical. Don't do that unless you know them real well, or you might get hit back. Uh, there's failure of your human ability. Every leader I know, and I know them all, I mean, I don't know them all, but I know a lot of major leaders, and every time we get down in intimate, it's really interesting, the guys that you think are fearless have all these fears in them, including me. But I'm overcoming, man. When you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you overcome that thing. All right. Now, how, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with fear? You first honor wherever that fear is coming from. You, you say, okay, Lord, I got, I got your attention, or you got my attention. And you start to position yourself to receive love and to give love. You release the possibilities of you ha that you have in that moment of being attacked with fear. What's your options? And then you make, then you remember what God says or what somebody says, or you wait long enough to somebody encourage you in the midst of it. Are you guys with me? I mean, this thing you can unpack a whole lot. You can release the supernatural. If you move in the gifts, the best way to get over fear, God is no, he doesn't take your gifts away. Whenever you're in fear, just start giving your gift away. It'll start to torment the devil because what he wants, he's giving you that fear to hold you back from releasing that gift that you have. Release favor. If people's cursing you, bless them. See, all this stuff makes sense. That's how you get over fear. See, that person starts cursing, you're going to say, those people's going to believe the lies he's saying. Well, you know what that means? They got the spirit of stupid and they just need to wait till they get the anointing of God on them. I'm not calling them stupid, but they got a spirit of stupidity. And I tell you, we got to get rid of that spirit of gossip in the church. Amen. Gossip is where the hot bed, the breeding bed for fear, because fear is the beginning step to cause you to not trust people. When they start talking about you or other leaders or what you do, it's how the, the enemy's number one bullet is fear. And it comes from gossip in the church a lot of times and false accusations. There's a lot the scripture says about that. You put honor before yourself. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to wind it down. This, I'm at the end of it. All right, and here, here's what I'm going to say. It's all right. I just stimulated. I just want to stir you up a little bit. How many believe you need to get rid of that spirit of fear? Now, let me just end with this scripture. Can I end with this scripture? Have I got enough time to read the scripture? Psalms 23. I'm not, I'm not being obnoxious. I'm really trying to honor because it's good for me too. Psalms 23. Familiar passage. This thing I have read my whole life. I mean, I don't think there's anybody here probably that's been in church, or even if you've never been in church, that you haven't heard the 23rd Psalm. The reason the 23rd Psalm is such an important passage, because it deals with fear. And the Lord was trying to whisper to us, fear not, for I'm with you. Let me read that. Psalms 23, and this is where I'll close. The Lord is my shepherd. If I'm going to deal with fear, Every time I've got to be remembering that he is my shepherd. And what does the Bible say we're supposed to do when we're looking for a shepherd? We're supposed to have our ears turned to hear his voice. Remember I said fear is an alarm clock. If we know the shepherd, the shepherd will speak to us in the midst of our fear. There is 
nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley. Everybody say darkest valley. You know what that word there means? Even when I go through the grave. That's what that's saying. You're going to go through the grave even though you have an encounter and a relationship with the shepherd. The good news is the devil can't keep us in the grave. The Bible said Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. How many say amen? But fear is what puts you in the grave. <clears throat> you might be breathing, you might be taking up space, but you're dead. And I'm going to pray a resurrection anointing on you today to take back what the devil stole from you. <laughs> I fear no danger. You see, it says after you get in the grave, how can you threaten a dead man? How can you be intimidated? God's allowed us to be killed. Because he wants us to be dangerous to the devil. The devil has no threat once we've conquered death, hell, and the grave. <sighs> For you are with me. Your rod and your staff. Man, you can unpack all kinds. They comfort me. The rod and the staff. You know what that's speaking of? Really, it's talking about relationship more than it is talking about somebody whipping you. It's talking about a rod of authority and a staff of, of, of loving. It's the people around us. We all should be taking that place. When you see somebody going, what we do in the church, when we're jealous of somebody, is we try to kill them instead of raise them up. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Now that scripture's loaded. And it's saying God wants you to die to judge the enemy, to let him know you're not afraid because you don't have a spirit of fear. You've got the fear of God. And you're paying attention to the warning, the alarm clock. Are you getting this about an alarm clock? I want to knock that spirit that you're getting an honest fear from God. Some of you's got a spirit of fear, and that thing will come off once you understand that. But God's going to put a fear of God in you that you're going to be able to just stomp through the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. Can you say amen? Everybody stand to their feet. Please. Does this help anybody? I mean, I gave the Reader's Digest version, but I think you got it. How many say amen? You getting that? When you start feeling fear in your bedchamber at night, when you feel fear, when you feel like you're intimidated, when you get around certain people, people say, well, I'm intimidated when I get around you. I tell them, that's why I always tell a joker, I look real stupid, I want them to get over it. It's not hard for me to look stupid, by the way. But here's the deal. I just changed feet. Anyway, here we go. I want to, can I just pray? I, I went a little bit over. But I want to pray. How many want to get rid of that spirit of fear? How many has got a sense you've been paying attention to and, and, and being, being seized by a spirit of fear today? You want to get over the top of it. And you got to realize there's a true emotional fear. I want to break right now you just hold your hands I want to just break something off you I want to break how the enemy's held you hostage how he's put handcuffs on you he's put ropes he's put fetters on you trying to make you think that you're unworthy that you're not full of faith you're full of faith when the fear of God is on you and God I pray right now that people will begin to shake off the chains because they're not even locked the enemy's been rattling them, making us think they're locked. I want you to shake your hands as a prophetic act. Say, Lord, shake these chains off. We're going to go on. We're going to take this city for God. We're going to take our families back. I'm taking my health back. I'm taking the kingdom in Jesus' name. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make this declaration. You can feel it, can't you? Come on, give him a shout.
You can feel that. It's coming up, and it's going to keep getting... With leaders, he tries to make us feel like we're a failure. When you have the edge, when you've had a word, and people don't pay any attention. You think you're a failure. And God said, no, shake the chains off, man. Because the sound is still going. I want to release the sound back in you. Fear tries to take your sound. <laughs> I can feel it in here. Now I'm just going to do this right here and then I'll roll it over to you, Eric. I want to ask this. Anybody in here this morning said, I'm afraid of dying because I don't know if I know Jesus or not. Is there anybody in here that's not sure? See, I don't believe in wimpy salvations. I believe the Bible says come boldly to the throne of grace. And in this room, you can feel the presence of God. The love of God is in here. I'm shouting, but I'm not shouting because I'm mad. I'm shouting because I'm happy. And I got good news. Anybody in here not sure if you walked out these doors and some crazy motorcycle ran over you and you maybe not be able to make it out. You're not sure if you'd find yourself in the arms of Jesus. Anybody 